Hello and welcome to another complete OCR GCSE PE lesson where you'll learn absolutely everything you need to know on topic 1.1, the structure and function of the skeletal system. As always, we'll be following the OCR syllabus exactly and we'll cover absolutely everything you need to know for your final exam. For topic 1.1, you need to know the names and locations of the major bones, the functions of the skeleton, the different types of synovial joint, the types of movement possible at ball and socket and hinge joints, and the roles of ligaments, cartilage and tendons. Before we begin, I'd really appreciate it if you took a moment to click the like button and subscribe to the channel if you'd like to be notified when the next topic is uploaded. We'll begin with the names and locations of the major bones, and there are 19 bones that you need to know. The axial skeleton is the central core of the skeleton to which the arms and legs are attached. It's comprised of the cranium or skull, the vertebrae which sit on top of one another to form the spine or vertebral column, the ribs, and the sternum or breastbone. Next, we'll look at the appendicular skeleton, which includes the bones of the arms, legs, hands, and feet, and the structures that secure these bones to the axial skeleton. Let's start at the top and work our way down. The clavicle is commonly known as the collarbone, and the scapula is the shoulder blade. The humerus runs from the shoulder down to the elbow, where it articulates with the radius and ulna in the forearm. Remember that the radius is the one that sits in line with the thumb. Moving down to the hand, we have the carpals at the top, metacarpals in the middle, and then the phalanges or finger bones. Now on to the lower body, beginning with the pelvis, which articulates with the femur at the hip joint. The knee is protected by the patella or kneecap, and below the knee, the tibia and fibula can be found the fibula being the smaller one of the two. The tarsals are the bones at the top of the foot, the metatarsals are in the middle, and then finally we have the phalanges again, which in this case are the toe bones. Okay, so that's it for the names and locations of the bones, and we'll move on now to our next learning objective, which is to understand and provide examples of the six main functions of the skeleton, which are to provide support, posture, protection, movement, blood cell production, and mineral storage. So the skeleton gives the body shape and supports its weight, giving us posture, or in other words, allowing us to stand upright. For example, the skeleton provides support for a weightlifter, as it allows them to hold the bar in a static position at the top of the lift. The next function is to protect the delicate vital organs, like the heart and lungs, which are protected by the ribs and sternum, and the brain, which is encased by the cranium. For example, the cranium protects the brain when heading a football. Next, the skeleton allows for movement, as the bones provide attachments for muscles, so that when the muscles contract, they use the bones as levers, creating movement at joints. For example, when performing a bicep curl, the bicep muscle pulls on the radius bone in the forearm, causing flexion at the elbow. The skeleton is also involved in the production of blood cells, as it contains bone marrow, which is the site of blood cell production. White blood cells form part of the immune system, helping to destroy pathogens like bacteria, while red blood cells contain haemoglobin and carry oxygen to the body's tissues. For example, red blood cell production allows a marathon runner, who relies on the efficient delivery of oxygen to their muscles, to continue exercising for long periods of time without tiring. The final function of the skeleton is to store minerals like potassium, iron and calcium, which is particularly important for maintaining bone density. For example, mineral storage benefits rugby players as it reduces the risk of obtaining a bone injury when tackling. Okay, that's the functions of the skeleton done. Let's move on to the next section on synovial joints. Okay, so the first thing that you need to know is the definition of a synovial joint. So a synovial joint is a freely movable joint as opposed to cartilaginous joints, which provide limited movement, and fixed joints, which don't allow movement at all. Within a synovial joint, the bones are covered by cartilage and are surrounded by a tough, fibrous joint capsule. The joint capsule is lined with a synovial membrane, which secretes synovial fluid, lubricating the inside of the joint. The two types of synovial joints that you need to know are hinge joints and ball and socket joints. Hinge joints are those that allow movement in one plane only, and examples include the knee and elbow, which are only capable of flexion and extension. The articulating bones at the knee are the femur and the tibia, and at the elbow, the humerus, radius, and ulna. Ball and socket joints, by comparison, allow for a wide range of movement in multiple planes, and include the shoulder and hip joints. 
The articulating bones at the shoulder are the humerus and scapula, and at the hip, the pelvis and femur. Okay, so that's everything you need to know on the types of synovial joint. So we'll move on now to the types of movement possible at both hinge and ball and socket joints. So as previously mentioned, hinge joints are only capable of flexion and extension. Flexion is a bending motion defined as a decrease in the angle around a joint. It occurs at the knee when preparing to strike a football and at the elbow when preparing to shoot in basketball. Extension is a straightening motion where the angle around a joint increases. It can be seen at the knee when taking off in high jump and at the elbow when striking a volleyball. By comparison, ball and socket joints are capable of flexion, extension, rotation, abduction, adduction and circumduction. At the shoulder, flexion involves moving the arm forwards and upwards, like when pitching in softball or rounders. At the hip, it's the movement of the thigh forwards and upwards towards the chest, for example when raising the knee while sprinting. At the shoulder, extension involves moving the arm downwards and backwards, for example, pulling the arm through the water when performing the front crawl. At the hip, it's the movement of the thigh downwards and backwards, for example, when pushing off the board in long jump. Rotation is when a bone turns about its longitudinal axis. And more on the axes of rotation and planes of movement in topic 1.3. Lateral rotation is rotation away from the body and can be seen at the hip when opening the foot to control a pass with the instep in football. Medial rotation is rotation towards the body and occurs at the shoulder when performing a forehand ground stroke in tennis. The next type of movement that you need to know is abduction, which can be defined as the movement of a limb away from the midline of the body. For example, at the shoulder, a goalkeeper raises their arm when making a save to the side of the goal, and at the hip, a gymnast moves their legs away from the midline of the body during a split. Adduction is the movement of a limb towards the midline of the body, for example, at the shoulder during the execution of a golf swing, and at the hip when kicking in breaststroke. The final type of movement that you need to know is circumduction, which is a combination of all the different types of movement we've covered so far. It's defined as a continuous circular movement of a limb around a joint. Circumduction occurs at the shoulder during the butterfly stroke in swimming and at the hip when performing a high kick in taekwondo. Okay, that's everything you need to know on the types of movement. So we'll move on to the final section on topic 1.1, other components of joints, specifically the role of ligaments, cartilage and tendons. So ligaments hold articulating bones together at joints and prevent any unwanted movements from occurring. Cartilage is a tough yet spongy material that lines and protects the ends of articulating bones, providing some shock absorption and reducing friction. Finally, tendons are bands of tough connective tissue that connect muscles to bones. Their role is to transfer force from the muscles as they contract to the bones, creating movement at joints. Well done. You've just covered absolutely everything you need to know on topic 1.1, the structure and function of the skeletal system. If you enjoyed this video, I'd really appreciate your subscription and I'll see you next time for topic 1.2, the structure and function of the muscular system.